Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've done over 500 of them now, and if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, <clears throat> please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site. My guest today is Kylea Taylor. Um, Kylea found gaps in ethics education in the early 1990s while simultaneously studying to be a marriage and family therapist and working as a senior trainer at the Groff Transpersonal Training, where she ass assisted Stanislav Groff in training practitioners of holotrophic breathwork. She observed that working with clients in non-ordinary states of consciousness requires different ethical awarenesses. She drew upon the tenets of several of the great religions to create inner ethics, a model for ethical self-reflection. The model clarifies the unique ethical territory of understanding and working skillfully with people who are experiencing profound and extraordinary states of consciousness and also provides a scaffolding for recognizing our semi-conscious inner motivations as practitioners, teachers, and caregivers in order to avoid client and student harm and increase client and student benefit. Her book, The Ethics of Caring, which I'm holding up here, um, Finding Right Relationships with Clients, illustrates transference, countertransference, power dynamics, dual relationship, and other topics important to relational ethics. The book won the 2017 Nautilus Book Award in the category Relationships and Communication. Kylia teaches, writes, and consults about ethics. She is also currently president and co-founder of Soul Collage Incorporated, which since 2003 has been training facilitators worldwide to share an expressive arts method that promotes deep self-discovery individually and in community. Kylia's focus as a therapist has been on assisting clients in integrating the meaning and extraordinary gifts of spiritual emergence, awakening, or transpersonal experiences, and what she calls personal paradigm shift phenomena. And her website is kyliataylor.com, and I'll be linking to it, of course, from her page on BatGap. So, welcome, Kylia. It's really good to be with you, Rick. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> listeners and viewers of this show will know that I have an interest in this topic. Um, and was instrumental in helping to found the, the Association for Spiritual Integrity, uh, which is spiritual-integrity.com, I think it is. Um, and I've given you know, a talk or two on this topic at the SAND conference and um, moderated panel discussions on it. Um, but I don't want to, well, I'm sure that in the course of this conversation, I'll reiterate some of the reasons why I am interested in it. But I'd first like to ask you, Kylie, since you're the one being interviewed, why you're interested in it. How did you get interested in it in the first place? <laughs> well, I think the short answer is I made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I got curious about that when I made mistakes. And I wondered, you know, how did I do that? What were my motivations? And I kind of had to find my way through shame and blame and um, find my way to self-compassion and discover my vulnerable motivations and needs so that I could avoid making those mistakes again. And I saw a lot of other people who were making mistakes and people that I respected. And the situation that really got my attention was a woman therapist who made a big ethical mistake and lost everything. Mm -hmm. She lost her license, she lost her house, she lost all her money. And uh, what I realized then, as you said in, in my bio, was that traditional ethics education, the laws, the codes, standards of care were incomplete without um, including attention to inner motivations. Mm -hmm. So our fears and desires can be semi-conscious and unconscious, and they can be very compelling and override our cognitive ethical self. Yeah. And so that was really interesting to me. And then and the inner ethics model that I 
finally created was a structure and a toolkit for people that are in responsible roles, caring for others to help those professionals and responsible parties increase their ethical awareness and prevent harm, even harm that they didn't intend to make. Mm. Um, of course, you're a professional licensed therapist, and so you've had a certain degree of ethical training, perhaps in your education, and you've also probably agreed to a code of ethics in order to become licensed and so on, uh, right? Right so far? Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> um, but in the, in the spiritual community, um, there is no formal structure for the most part, although certain Buddhist sanghas and so on have, you know, like Spirit Rock ha have codes of ethics and have, and, and for instance, the, the diamond approach of, of A.H. Almas has, again, a code of ethics and, and certain fairly rigorous um, criteria that one has to meet in order to become a, a representative or a teacher in that, in that school. But to a great extent, the whole spiritual community is kind of the in the wild, wild west. Um, yeah. You know, there, there is no formal training or certification or oversight of any kind, and people are just doing whatever they are inclined to do. And it's, it's kind of incumbent upon the students to determine the legitimacy of a teacher. And uh, there have been many, many cases where um, students have been burned and hurt um, by teacher misbehavior. And I could get on my soapbox here and continue, but I think I'll send it back to you for some comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think you're, what you did with ASI and uh -huh. creating that code of ethics and creating especially the guidelines for students is a really great first step for this. Um, I think, you know, we have to get to critical mass in the culture where people expect professionals to do self-reflection and to be open to feedback. And, uh, you know, that's kind of my mission. You know, that's the greater mission, I think, to change the ethos of our culture, to be more honest and open to feedback. Yeah, and there's a, there's a bit of a wind at your, at your back these days with the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement and so on. And that's a, right. A number of other situations where people are just fed up, you know, with the kind of um, misbehavior that's been going on. When I first came up with this, really, there was nobody interested in it. Um, and we sent out one flyer, I think, to massage schools, and they were interested. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in 20 years, we sold 20,000 copies of the first book without any other advertising. Oh, good. Uh, so that that community was interested, but um, not, you know, there was no critical mass in any other community. Yeah. Part of the reason, part of the reason I think this is so important is that, you know, maybe I'm naive or overly optimistic, but I, I really think that spirituality, as I understand it, and as we often discuss it on this program, mm -hmm. is very fundamental and very pivotal in helping to bring about a change that the world very much needs to undergo. And um, it could be that the whole, I mean, not to get melodramatic, but that the whole fate of humanity kind of hangs in the balance and that spirituality, a spiritual awakening is critical in helping that, that, that fate to go in a positive direction. And I think that um, the spiritual community shoots itself in the foot when its representatives or its leaders um, misbehave. It's almost like some kind of inner sabotage taking place that can handicap the effort. Yeah. What do you think about that? Well, it, well, it's not only the misbehaving, but it's, uh, it's really more about not owning the misbehaving. Right. Rationalizing. And not, and not accepting feedback about things that they can't see or don't want to see. Mm -hmm. And changing because they're not modeling development for their students. What does that mean, not do modeling that. development? Not modeling growing and learning how to be in relationship with other people, um, with the world. I mean, that's really what spirituality is about, is learning how to relate in this world of duality with other beings and other things, um, treating them as you would want to be treated. Yeah. And understanding why that's important. And that may be something that the teacher himself has not really learned properly. Um, 
if he had, then probably he'd be modeling it, right? Right. Yeah. Well, you know, people develop more strongly in different ways at different times, and uh, there may be a relational uh, re retardation in some way uh, with some people. Yeah, Ken Wilber has his lines of development model where we can be right. quite advanced along certain lines and rather stunted along other lines. And, uh, you know, you could have attained a fairly significant awakening or a higher level of consciousness and yet be a real jerk in some other <laughs> respect. That's, that's right. I was, I was thinking about Ken when I, when I said that. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so some of the blowback that I've gotten regarding this whole topic and my involvement in the ASI and all is, you know, firstly, there's this sort of knee-jerk reaction that, oh, you, what is this, the God Squad? Who do you, who you guys think you are, you know, to pass judgment on people? Do you think you're holier than thou? And, and uh, you know, that kind of thing. And who's to say what's right and wrong and, and so on and so forth. Um, have you run into that kind of mentality? I have run into it in myself. Yeah. You know, when, when somebody first asked me to be on an ethics committee, mm -hmm. I said no. Uh -huh. um, I, I said, and I think a lot of people feel that way. They don't want... Uh, to be righteous, maybe part of them wants to be righteous, but in general, they don't want to be righteous and say somebody else is wrong, and they don't want to be controlled by other people, mm -hmm. and they are defensive about the skeletons in their closet. I was. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, righteousness is almost synonymous with hypocrisy, you know, because there have been so many righteous people, <laughs> self-righteous people, who have been guilty of the very things that they're railing about from the pulpit or from the, their teaching platform. Yeah, but ethics really is one of the most interesting things in life. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at any, if you're enamored of any series on TV, for example, mm -hmm. it's full of ethical dilemmas. Yeah. It's the interesting stuff. It's what turns you on and what turns you off, you know, what conflicts you have. And, and that's the way, it's a path to self-discovery, mm -hmm. really. And I think that's why in spiritual systems with, you know, like the yamas and the niyamas and the precepts and Buddhism and the commandments and Christianity and the uh, Quran, um, all of those start the spiritual path with things that you have to kind of follow. And what happens is you come into conflict because part of you doesn't want to do them. Yeah. And you find out, you know, what's what about that? And gradually purify your ability to be in relationship. Mm. Some say that, you know, we can only act according to our level of consciousness and that you can give people all the precepts in the world. But if their level of consciousness is not very well developed, <clears throat> they won't be able to follow them. Like, you know, there's that saying, you know, what would Jesus do? And, you know, my response is, well, you kind of have to be Jesus to, to know, you know. <laughs> and even then you might do something different because you're not, even if you're at his level of consciousness, you're a different person and might behave That's differently right. in different circumstances. Right. But you have to, you, you're learning, yeah. you know, as you go. And hopefully, I guess the consciousness part is how open are you to learning? And what I call my motto in my model is, make new mistakes you know, in other words learn. make new mistakes <laughs> yeah rather than making make the, the same, same old ones, ones right. all the time <clears throat> yeah and obviously don't make them intentionally just for the heck of it to see what that mistake would feel like but <laughs> try Absolutely. to try to avoid making them but realize you're going to be fallible yes it was tongue in cheek yeah. but yes <laughs> um, well i mean i think many people would argue that right and wrong are kind of relative terms, and they're very much in the context of different cultures, for instance. I mean, some cultures might say there's nothing wrong with polygamy, and others would say that there is, and you, know, some, and you have things that are in the Bible, particularly Leviticus and some of the chapters, which are, would be downright illegal in our society and would be considered um, barbaric, and yet they're in the Bible. Um, and some people take that as the Bible is literal, you know, literally true under in all of its parts. So um, who's, how can we arrive at some kind of universal or absolute understanding 
of something which seems so relative? I, I use the term right relationship, uh -huh. not as right versus wrong, as you just said, but rather in the same sense that Buddhists talk about right action or right livelihood. Mm -hmm. And to me, right relationship is, it's situational, it's a moving target. Mm. But the thing that is um, constant is that the professional or the personal that's the responsible party in caring for someone uh, is the well, is a true well-wisher, wholeheartedly has a well-wishing sense of wanting the best thing for this person that they're caring for that is possible. And that takes many forms, but that, that to me is a kind of a bottom line. Yeah, so do unto others is... Exactly. Right, right. okay. And, and even do unto this special person what's in the best interest of this special person. Yeah. Mother Teresa used to say that she kind of regarded all the people she was serving as Christ himself, and she was just, you know, tending to Christ's wounds and sicknesses mm -hmm. and so on when she was helping the, the people mm -hmm. of Calcutta. Yeah. And, and everybody has that Christ consciousness or divine spark inside them, and you can use that as a, a way of doing the best. Yeah. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I jotted down a, a quote from your book. You said, um, ethical development requires an appreciation of our interconnectedness. We all have to dive into our own well to reach the underground river that connects all sources of water. I like that. Mm, I got that from a guru. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The idea is that you don't, he was trying to say that the idea is you don't go into a lot of different systems. You go deeply into one system and you find the same water. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that metaphor. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, don't dig a whole lot of shallow wells, dig one deep one. Exactly, right? exactly. Um, but then there's the idea of dig, using 10 tools to dig one well. But anyway, mm -hmm. we won't get into that. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, the, the essential point there is that, you know, if we see deeply enough, we realize we're all one person. We're all, you know, essentially the same. Not only, not only similar or identical, but we're all the same self, capital S. And yeah. so whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto, unto me, you know. I think that says it, yeah. Yeah. Um, as you know, the, the Hindus have the concept of Dharma. And as I understand it, Dharma means, um, you know, that course of action which is most evolutionary in any given circumstance. And it's, it, and it's not something you can just codify and, uh, and, you know, have a whole book you've studied and know exactly what to do in any circumstance because the whole thing is too complex. It somehow has to become so deeply imbibed in your consciousness that it will be spontaneous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think my guru, again, defined Sanat and Dharma as the true religion, the, the yeah. river that goes through all religions. Yeah. And it's the same with right relationship. I feel the same way about right relationship. Right relationship is a river of well-wishing that goes through lots of different ways that, that it takes form. Mm -hmm. Do you mind saying who your guru was? Um, I was initiated by Amrit Desai, but I really, it was very interesting. I, um, sh I, I got Shaktipat and then I came, I decided I was going to live there for a summer, mm -hmm. for four months. And I came five days after his guru came, mm. Swami Kripal Vanandaji, and I have always felt he was my guru, although he was technically my grandfather guru. Mm -hmm. Upa guru, um, they call it, yeah. 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 So I really, I've just really reconnected. Some books are out about him recently, and reading all the talks that he gave that summer, he broke his silence and gave his gave talks. And um, he's an he was he changed my life. 
Oh, good timing on your part to have shown up yes. when you did. It's the universe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Amrit Desai has been on that gap. And, and of, of course, you know, ironically, he had his own ethical crisis. And uh, it was dealt with in a rather mature way by that community, as I recall. Um, mm -hmm. Is that part of what motivated you to get interested in this topic? Is it kind of so close to no. home, so to speak? No, I didn't know any of that was going on at the time that I was there. Uh -huh. um, I did send him my first book, but I never received any <laughs> any uh, response from it. Yeah. After I heard about what was going on, and I think I think leaders that have that problem miss an opportunity to own it. You know publicly and and teach by that and that, that's kind of what i said to him which was really probably not something he wanted to hear at the time yeah but i saw the interview that you did with amrit mm -hmm. and you know the the way he i knew he asked the question you know and then the way he answered it was well when you're in that kind of sadhana there's very very strong energy in the second chakra mm -hmm. And energy sometimes just goes down and out yeah. instead of up and in. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that sounds like boys will be boys, you know. <laughs> um, and it really doesn't deal with the betrayal of a disciple when sexual uh, activity happens between the guru and the disciple. Because, you know, a lot of times people call, as I do, Guru Bapaji, dear father, mm -hmm. it means. And so, and also there's a stage in, in um, sadhana where it's really important to surrender, surrender everything in loving bhakti. And when that is abused, it is like child abuse. It's like incest, yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. And... It's devastating to somebody. Not only has the guru been hypocritical about brahmacharya or abstinence, but he has betrayed and violated the trust of the disciple. So, and I, and I think you can come back from that. You know, you if you own it and you look at it and you say, I'll, I'll never do that again. And maybe he did that privately. And that's possible. And and I'm not trying to judge him. But I'm just saying that as a, as a public figure, if you do something like that, and you know, it's in the it's in the lawsuits and everything anyway, why not own it and, and teach thereby? Yeah, I know I kind of sprung that question on him, and um, I remember that answer, and I thought at the time, yeah, but then obviously you're, you're saying you're a work in progress and, and vulner, vulnerable as a, you know, relatively unenlightened student might be expected Absol to be, you know, but if you're posing Ab as the guru, <laughs> then there's a certain responsibility that comes with that. But I don't think gurus are ever at their final point. I don't either. You know, and that's, that's what one has to model if one is a teacher, that you're always learning. And I'm not, you know, I'm just speaking of one thing. He gave me a ton of stuff. He gave me Bapaji. He gave me Shaktipat. He, yeah. he taught me a lot of things that he taught in satsang I use in my therapy. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, no, I totally understand. Um, and, uh, you know, my teacher had some ethical lapses, but he saved my life, you know, and so I'm all, all, and I'll always be grateful for that. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's good not to throw the baby out with bathwater and be too black and white in one's thinking, but at the same time, it's important. I think we'll be getting into this more. It's important to be discriminating and discerning and call a spade a spade and not, not sort of rationalize away inappropriate behavior because oh, well, this guy seems to be so enlightened and this couldn't have taken place, or even if it did take place, it couldn't be wrong because he's enlightened and how could he do anything wrong? And you hear that kind of thinking among, among students. Yeah. Well, people really, and this gets into 
the model a little bit. I talk about transference and countertransference in my model, and people need to do transference. They need to explain so, those terms, point, okay? Yeah, transference is really projection of past dynamics, past relational dynamics onto another person. So give us an example. Uh, well, I was going to give you the example of the spiritual teacher. Uh -huh. People need to love themselves, but what they do first is unconditionally love the guru. Mm. And then at some point, they need to bring that back and understand that they are loving themselves and that they also have the divine spark in them. So it's important to hold that so that they can see it, but it's not, it's important not to get identified with it too mm. and inflated. And what happens, I think the spiritual leaders a lot of times is they're isolated yes. in, and they are isolated from feedback and peer support. Sometimes intentionally, they don't want it. That's right. They don't. And yeah, so that's, yeah. That's I, what I copied a paragraph from your book on that point. You said, a leader of a spiritual community may isolate himself from colleagues who are genuine peers or mentors. He sees himself as a pioneer in his field, a maverick, a creative genius who is ahead of his time. His peers might present him with ethical objections to his treatment of family, friends, lovers, students, and clients, but he would dismiss this feedback as the moralistic grumbling of smaller, quote, neurotic minds, jealous of his attainments and his following. And, and that is almost literally what, the kind of thing I've heard some teachers say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you really, it's, it's hard not to get inflated when you, that's all you hear. You're carrying the transference of a huge community who needs to see love outside themselves. Yeah. So if you were, let's say, counseling a, a, a well-known spiritual teacher, and, um, you know, he had built quite a following and, and maybe he began to feel that he was in danger of getting a bit too big for his britches or just, you know, just getting carried away with all the adulation that was being showered upon him. How would you advise him and that spiritual community to deal with it so as not uh, to allow pro problems to arise? Well, I'm a really big fan of peer supervision. I, I don't know how that would work in a spiritual community because what he would have to find, and maybe he's too isolated to find it, is other professionals who are spiritual leaders or psychologists or therapists to have regular meetings with to talk about. It, you know, I, in, I think uh, peer supervision groups could really use the Johari window. Do you know the Johari window? No. It's, it's a very interesting um, diagram that was done in the 50s by two guys named Joe and Harry. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and it's, a, it's a square mm -hmm. with four quadrants. Maybe we'll and, paste it in here at this point yeah, in the interview. We'll find it we, and paste it in, yeah. We could. So one quadrant is the open and free quadrant where it's all the things I know about myself and all the things you know about me. And then... There's the other quadrant where I have secrets and I know them, but you don't know them. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to know them, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. And then there's another quadrant where you know things about me that I can't see mm. and I don't know. And in order for me to know them, I have to ask or be open to feedback or both. Mm. And then the final quadrant is where you don't know these things about me and I don't know these things about me. And I really have to do personal deep work to get to that stuff that's in there. And I would say personal deep work is uh, breath work, deep therapy work, hypnosis work, psychedelic medicine work, um, going into deep non-ordinary states of consciousness where you are letting, you are giving the inner healer, the inner healer that's always looking for conditions where it can bring what's on top of our 
psychic list that needs to be healed um, up so that it can be healed. So it's looking for the right conditions and it brings up the material. And I think spiritual teachers need to do that too. And, and it can happen in meditation or sadhana, but it, you know, maybe stronger something else, something that's less defended, maybe less familiar might be helpful. Yeah. There's that Robert Burns poem about, you know, seeing ourselves as others see us. Yeah. Um, I can't do the Gaelic or whatever that <laughs> dialect was, but um, well, this is an interesting consideration. I mean, you know, I know I know some teachers who do do that sort of thing. For instance, uh, Miranda McPherson, who has been on the show for a couple of times, uh, mentioned that she frequently sort of uh, goes to other teachers' te um, satsangs or whatever, and also gets sits with a therapist periodically just to sort of do some house cleaning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other teachers I, I know who have done some of the other things you just mentioned. But there's, I, I would say it's in the minority. I, I would say most teachers just keep kind of going along and doing their thing. And, you know, maybe the, maybe some of them get feedback from some friends and students. But um, a lot of them just seem to be on a roll, from, from my observation, and don't have the that kind of opportunity for, for scrutiny by others. Well, I think their lives get very busy. Yeah, they and do. It's and it's hard to make time. Mm -hmm. I know that in my life right now, I need some time too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's also a tendency for teachers to, or many people, to have had a profound awakening, and feel a sense of completion, and not kind of realize that there's a lot of cobwebs to be swept out of dark corners. You know, they they just seem so full and clear and blissful or whatever and wise and um, it kind of, unless, unless they do so intentionally or others sort of present them with it, they're not likely to go looking for those cobwebs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think if there's any egregious unethical behavior, it, it behooves the community to bring that to the guru's attention. Yeah. for the leader's attention. But it's sometimes very difficult to be heard. It is, not only because the teacher might just brush you off, but because there's a lot of peer pressure not to do that. And most of, the, most of your yeah. peers in that community won't even believe that the behavior is taking place unless they have more direct evidence of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just sex. It's also... Although it usually is. <laughs> it usually is. The, uh, the worst stuff really is. Yeah. But, but also money. I mean, people with trust funds can be exploited and so forth. So, yeah. I know yeah. Ex current examples of that where large sums of money are being taken by teachers that I know things about that if the person who's giving that money knew, they wouldn't give it. Right. Yeah. So. And and uh, also can be exploited in the power center in my model mm -hmm. um, by disempowering someone yeah. rather than empowering someone. Explain that a little bit. Well, just keeping a person in a place of dependency mm. rather than empowering them to be all that they can be. And I don't have a, a specific example, but, you know, there's many ways that can can happen. I can think of it. Um, okay. Uh, well, just that, um, you know, a lot of times there's a, a strong hierarchical structure built up in spiritual communities um, where this, the, there's, it's not like a circle arrangement where everybody is including the teacher is kind of on the same level, but the teacher is literally and figuratively up on, on high, on a pedestal, uh, on a dais or on a stage. And that, that dynamic sort of perpetuates the, the mindset that, you know, this person, I, I, I couldn't possibly challenge this person or know certain things that they don't know or something like that. You can probably elaborate, but that, that, that seems to be quite common. Yeah. Yes, not 
validating that they have gifts to offer and always keeping them one down. Yeah. Yeah. Irene sent a question over here. She said, what about my cobwebs? <laughs> Har harping <laughs> on the same topic and lecturing to people is, is uh, oh, it wasn't for public consumption? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I admit to having cobwebs. I, it's not a, I don't mind. Um, and as I've, you know, like you said at the very beginning of the interview, you know, you made certain ethical mistakes which made you more interested in ethics. And, you know, and I have too. Um, and I feel like each one has made me much more inclined to scrutinize myself and be careful and be, what is it, Don Juan, Carlos Castaneda's teacher said, a warrior has time only for his impeccability. And yeah. um, Padma Sambhava said, um, and I'm not referring to my own awareness here, but Padma Sambhava said, though my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to, to karma is as fine as a grain of barley flour. Wow. Wow. So, you know, no one is, even these, you know, great beings are, um, well, here I go calling them great beings, but they, they are in a certain respect or were, uh, is above the possibility or beyond the possibility of stumbling in some way. I remember there's a beautiful story, I'll just tell it briefly and then get back to you. Um, you I, one of the things I really liked in Yogananda's book was that when he met his teacher, Sri Yakteswar, Sri Yakteswar, you know, said to him, you know, if I ever seem to be falling from my state of God consciousness, you know, call me on it, help me, you know, bring it to my attention. Yeah, well, I think Irene brought up a good thing because mm -hmm. where, where spiritual leaders, ethical problems or relational problems may happen is in their personal relationships. Mm -hmm. And so that might be the first place to, to look. Yeah. It's cool. kind of handy to, to be married in a way or to be in a close relationship because then you're a lot less able to get away with your, with your stuff, you know, with your idiosyncrasy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's in your face. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I lived in a monastic community for about 15 years and, and you could get really kooky and you know, no one would really call you on it because if they did, you could always gravitate to someone, some other area of the thing and, and not, have, not have it be in your face. Right. So marriage was a bit True. of a wake-up call. <clears throat> um, so as we go along, any time an idea comes to mind that I'm not bringing up, feel free to just bring it up. And those who are listening, if they have questions, feel free to send them in. Um, you brought up the term ethical fading in your book. And uh, elaborate on that term a bit, and then I might have a question or two. Well, the idea, and it's not my term, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, you probably have the, the name of the person there that came up with it. But it's when organizations gradually have an ethos of taking care of themselves to the detriment of their clients. I think mm. the one example that was used there was actually a midwife or a doula who brought this up mm -hmm. because um, somebody who was in the last stages of labor came into the hospital and had to fill out all kinds of forms and, and standing there, you know, just and what labor. should have yeah. exactly and what should have happened is that she would went immediately to a place where she could be comfortable and have the baby as quickly as it wanted to come yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like that it's like what are we putting in place in our organizations in values and in um you know their forms and procedures that get in the way of taking care of what we're supposed to take care of. Our clients, our customers, our, our employees. Yeah. One thought that that term evokes for me, and I don't, I don't know if it's the way you intended it, is that, you know, very often spiritual organizations start out kind of fresh and pure and inspiring and so on. And then they just very gradually, incrementally, <laughs> kind of go off the rails, um, you know, get weirder and weirder, more and more cult-like, more and more dysfunctional, and, um, you know, and it happens, it's like that old, I don't think this is a true example that anyone that would, that would really work, but there's that old thing about 
tossing a frog into boiling water as opposed to just heating up the water slowly, you know. And yeah. if, if it's heated slowly, the frog doesn't realize it, and so he doesn't jump out. Um, but I don't like that example because I wouldn't toss a frog into boiling water or, or heat I it know. up slowly. But, but in any case, you know, if the thing happens slowly enough, people just, their own mentality sort of adjusts to it as it happens, and they don't realize how, how strange the whole thing is becoming. Yes, I think that happens. And I think people don't like change, and they can get, as I said in the beginning, right relationship is a moving target. Um, it's not static. Mm -hmm. And when, when a community or an organization gets to have static roles and static, and they're not looking at themselves as an organization, then you get that kind of thing. Because people don't like to change. And it seems to me that the best organizations are organizations where change is a given. Like we're always doing it. We don't get to, to stop and go into what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. I think another thing that come, sometimes goes along with this ethical fading thing is that the notion that starts to creep in that the end justifies the means. Um, you know, what our, our mission is so glorious and it's going to have such a wonderful effect on the world that it doesn't matter if we violate these tax laws or, you know, smuggle money in a suitcase or, you know, uh, it, or, and, and individuals are dispensable. That's another one. The mission is so grand that if a few individuals are sacrificed along the way, um, yeah. that's not going to matter. Yeah. Did you see the documentary on the Rajneesh? Yeah, Ashram? Wild Wild Country. Yep. Watch the whole thing. <laughs> A fabulous documentary, I thought, and that was an example of that kind of thing, I think. Yeah. And, you know, funnily enough, I mean, just to sort of give some credit where credit is due, I, you know, I have a number of friends who went through all that and um, are wonderful people. You know? <laughs> they have, I know, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying, I thought it was a fabulous documentary because it was done talking to first-person people yeah. on both sides. Mm -hmm. And it showed the harm that was done, but it also showed, you know, what were the motivations of the people that were doing the harm and how it just didn't get sorted out before it all fell apart. Yeah. Do you think in some convoluted roundabout way, um, it, uh, I don't mean to, for this to sound like an alibi, but do you think that Sometimes people, it's their, it's sort of in their best interest to go through a, uh, an experience with a corrupt teacher because it, it teaches them some things that through the school of hard knocks that they wouldn't have learned so easily in, with a more benign teacher. Well, I wouldn't prescribe it no, that's any, good point. More than I, <laughs> any more than I would prescribe uh, child abusing parents. Right. But, but it, it's true that our wounds teach us, no matter how they're, how they, which, which ones, we all have them, uh, which ones we get. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you wouldn't prescribe it, uh, but a lot of people say in retrospect that this or that that they went through, they're kind of grateful for, despite the fact that they wouldn't have asked for it to be. Well, I, I interviewed a guy named Damien Eccles, um, a couple months ago who spent 18 years on death row for a murder that he didn't commit and he said if I had it to do all over again I'd do it all over again because I used that time to focus so deeply on my spiritual practice that it, it transformed me. Wow. Mm -hmm. it gave a new meaning to a cell or a monastic cell. I yeah guess. really. It's yeah. quite a story. Yeah. A, a question came in um, from a man or a woman named Narsi from Chennai, India. Narsi asks, um, we talk about the guru's ethical mistakes, which is important. How about the ethics of the student? Why do so many students fall for the guru's advances, you know, both sex and money? It seems like students are just too eager to fall. I think um, students are in the vulnerable role. You know, when there's a power differential, they're in the vulnerable mm -hmm. role. And in the healing process, I think people are always trying to create a corrective experience. And the inner healer may say, well, this 
this guru looks good. That's a good parent figure. I can project on that parent figure. And this time it's going to be the good daddy or the good mommy. Mm. And then when it isn't, there's betrayal. But I do think at the same time, what we can do is what you've done with the student guidelines is education about discernment, about what they deserve in terms of a spiritual teacher or a, or a therapist or any whoever it is, the spiritual leader, because they need to know, students need to know. And the other thing is that students and clients make up the bulk of this population in the spiritual community. Mm -hmm. And we're never going to get to critical mass until the students and clients are part of the awareness. I feel very strongly about that point. Yeah. I hope that answered good Narcy's question. Yeah, it did for for me anyway. I hope and feel free to ask a follow up Narcy if you if you'd like to ask more about that. Um, Okay, um, you've, I, I don't, one thing we may not have touched on yet is that, um, and you can comment on this, is that, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the teachers and the obligation of the teachers and so on and so forth, uh, but, not, well, Narcy's question kind of segues us into this, which is that, um, would you say that ethical behavior has a value for the student, it, regardless of, what the teacher may or may not be doing, just in that student's own life, because um, <clears throat> lack of it is um, is weakening or damaging or impurifying in some way. It's kind of like letting the water out of the bathtub while you're trying to fill the bathtub at the same time. <clears throat> yes, I think that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, one of the concepts <clears throat> in my model is protection, permission, and connection. And those are the three elements that are needed in balance in any healing container. Mm -hmm. And I think if the guru can provide those, then there is a, an opportunity to learn. I don't think anybody can learn or heal without protection, without safety. Yeah, elaborate on each of those a little bit. Yeah, well, protection is... Safety is having uh, clear agreements, keeping the agreements, having honesty and uh, clear messages about money and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And permission is really providing that encouragement, that empowerment, validating uh, what, they, what they experience, <clears throat> if it's true, and encouraging risk to the level that would not be breaking. In other words, if you're doing yoga, you stretch, but you don't break. Injury is so, something. but encouraging enough change, encouraging change. And the connection is helping people connect in a good way, have right relationship with all their inner parts, have right relationship with other people, and the guru would be modeling that right relationship in connection with the person. So all those things in balance, some people need more protection, some people need more permission, is important. And I don't know whether I went off of what uh, you were talking about, good, but I, yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's an important thing. Ethical behavior, I was trying to say that ethical behavior happens when the container is ethical in that way, is balanced with all those three elements. Hmm. Um, okay, so just to play on that a bit more, so if those three elements aren't balanced, um, then you say, you're, you might be implying that unethical behavior is more likely to occur, right, if there's an imbalance. It might, it, yes, it might disempower somebody or, yes, mm -hmm. um, dishonesty, that kind of thing. As a therapist, have you um, dealt with very many people who have been hurt by either by spiritual teachers or by other by therapists of various other kinds? A, a few, uh -huh. yes. 
And is there anything yeah. in your experience with them um, which would be useful to, to add to the conversation here? Well, I think, you know, if somebody's hurt by a spiritual community and a spiritual teacher that they've really given their trust to and followed all their guidance and so forth, it, it really is very damaging, especially if it's a long-term situation. You know, it, it impacts your self-esteem and your ability to make decisions. So, yeah, it's, if you can clean all that up with the ASI, we'd be very happy. <laughs> well, thanks, we'll get right to it. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, one point that comes to my mind is that, it, you know, when a person has, well, just as I'm sure if someone has been abused by their father or by a teacher or something like that, it, it sort of creates a deep impression that can yeah, kind of scar them for life in a way. It makes it very hard for them to trust uh, father figures or other teachers and so on. I've seen it in the spiritual realm where people have gotten very cynical or disillusioned um, about all spiritual teachers or about spirituality in general because of some bad experience they've had. And uh, that's a shame, I think. And it's also, I wouldn't want the karma of the teacher that, that caused that to happen. Yeah. I think it can be healed. Yeah. And I think a lot of wounding that happens, happens like that, happens in an ordinary state. If you're in a real bhakti state, you're, you're in a non-ordinary state mm -hmm. of consciousness. And I think just like the wounding happened in a non-ordinary state, healing happens in a non ordinary state. Oh. So there are places you can go. There's a lot of PTSD research being done by MAPS right now, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, mm -hmm. who are using MDMA for trauma healing. And they've had incredible success with it. It's I, I don't know if you know about it, but oh, it's... Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but they're anticipating that it will be legal in a couple of years hmm. so that therapists can use it. And you just have to do it, you know, one to three times, something like that, and use therapy in addition to that. And it helps people work through the trauma that occurred without the fear of feeling the wounding, feeling the trauma again. It, it's a real mitigating a fear medicine. Yeah, I don't remember whether this was in your book or, or perhaps in something that I came across when I was preparing for Michael Pollan and Chris Beisha's interview last week, but there was something about people who had suffered from PTSD being made to watch horrible videos of, of violent things happening to people to sort of desensitize them to stressors like that. And I thought, wow, what a what a crude <laughs> kind of. I think therapy. that's. I think that's really crazy. Yeah, me I think too. It's very crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think you have to go into a place where you're really safe. And this is not like doing MDMA at a at a rave or something. And <laughs> this is like eye shades, lying down, two sitters or two therapists, mm -hmm. and really going into your inner world. Yeah. Well, and but, oh, sorry, and the, I just want to say what the statistics are, because it's really kind of amazing that 68% of people who have done this therapy, three sessions and therapy in between, in one year after that, they have no PTSD symptoms. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's nothing like that is available for PTSD yet. Yeah. Um. I do know that some types of meditation are being used for PTSD sufferers, and they're also getting some very good results. Um, but any, anything that works, you know? Any, yeah, anything absolutely. Well, I'm glad you kind of brought up this state at this point, because um, a lot of your book focuses on the point that non-ordinary states are, they bring up compelling desires and fears and longings in people. Um, and so, there are special needs for clients in these profound states of consciousness. And uh, it almost, I, I used to go on a lot of long 
meditation courses, six weeks, six months sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you'd, you'd get into the, the depth of the course and you'd kind of feel like jello, which hadn't really been molded yet and could be molded in any direction. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and then as the, as the course was to end, you would gradually taper off the amount of meditation you were doing over you know, a period of weeks or even a couple of months or something, depending on the length of the course. And so the, the, the mold would sort of form carefully. Um, but anyway, um, there's a kind of an openness or a vulnerability that when people get into non-ordinary states, however those states have been um, evoked, that I think deserves special consideration. And, and you've talked about it quite a bit in your book, so please talk about it a, a bit more now. Yeah, well, I think you've described it. I think people are really much more suggestible. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a hypnotic state, it's similar to a hypnotic state. Hmm. So that if you have a sitter or a therapist and you're really in a non-ordinary state, like one that is um, catalyzed by breath work or psychedelic medicine, then you're not, I lost my train of thought. If you're in a non-ordinary state uh, that has been brought about by breath work or some other thing, uh, then you're susceptible, suggestible. Or, yes, yeah. you're susceptible to any kind of intervention. Yeah. So it's re I think it's really important to not intervene and follow. And what we're trained to do in holotropic breath work is more like midwifery, mm -hmm. you know, just to follow the process of the person and assist them when they're when you when they ask for it when they ask for it verbally or non-verbally but to let leave them alone and let the inner healer do the rest i i love what leo leo zeff was a psychedelic therapist in la in the 50s 60s and 70s under underground and he was interviewed in a book called the secret chief and he said I was, he was a psychologist and he said, I started out doing this and I started doing therapy on them when they were taking LSD or whatever. And then I realized that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I have no idea what they need. The only thing that does is something inside them. They don't even cognitively know, know what they need, but it'll take care of it. All you have to do is you know, trust the inner healer once mm. that non-ordinary state is is brought into it. So I think a lot of bad things happen when interventions are made without asking. This is one of my questions in my book. Who's this for? You know, we all, when we're making interventions as a therapist or a leader or answering questions, we have to say, who's this for? Is this for me? Am I doing this for my benefit, or is it really for the client's best interest? Mm. How much uh, psychedelic therapy is actually going on now? I mean, it's it's not legal to do in a uh, kind of a routine basis, and I know there's some research taking place at John Hop Johns Hopkins and NYU and some other places, but some in your book and and uh, you allude to it being done by people and um, and I guess MAPS, you know, it has these big conferences and everybody's talking about it. So is there a whole lot of underground kind of psychedelic therapy taking place? I, th I think there is. Uh -huh. And um, I I think you, the people that you had on last week, uh -huh. Michael Pollan and um, Chris, Beige. Chris Beige talked about that. And, yeah. and I think it's gradually becoming legalized Gradually, I think MDMA is the uh, what do you call that? The prowl of the ice breaking right, ship the, or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the reason is because the government really wants to save billions of dollars on PTSD care for veterans. Yeah. Uh, so any way it happens will be good because veterans will benefit from this. I heard a story on NPR this morning that. Um, police are twice as likely to die from suicide as they are from being shot by somebody on the job. Wow. And it's because of the incredible stress they're under um, wow. all the time. 
Yeah, well, they've done a lot of research with people like firefighters and, and police and veterans, as well as child abuse. Yeah. What do you see as the sort of um, potential downside of psychotherapy, psychedelic therapy? I mean, it, it kind of, you know, went off the rails in the 60s with Timothy Leary and, and all and, uh, you know, became illegal. What, what, could, um, what could scuttle it now? That, that needs to be sort of attended to and prevented? I think the biggest issue that they're trying to grapple with is training Qualification. therapists. Yeah. Qualifications. If you're working with non-ordinary states, you need lots of training in experiential non-ordinary states. <laughs> uh, you, you need to know what's happening, what kind of field is created, what kind of compelling motivations come up, fears and desires in you. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think the best training I've seen so far is the Groff transpersonal training because it's a two, it's at least a two year training. It has nine weeks mm -hmm. of training in it and people get to be a sitter and then a breather into paired sessions. And when they're a sitter, they really notice all the things that all the things they would like to do to fix that person when they're having uh, experiences and feelings and don't do it. And then we talk about it. And when they're a breather, they learn what, what happens in that non-ordinary state, the kind of experiences that can happen, the variety of experiences that can happen and the intensity of them. So you're alluding to holotropic breathwork, and I think we need to explain it a little bit more. Um, I, yeah, in, I interviewed yeah. Stan Groff about four years ago, and I don't think I did a very good job. I had too much going on that weekend, and I was tired, and I didn't, I've always felt bad that I didn't do justice to the man because I think he's really been a giant in, in this in so many ways. Uh, but you worked with him a lot, um, so please explain. Did, did, let me start you with a question. Did he introduce holotropic breath work because psychedelics had become illegal and he was looking for a, a non-chemical way of eliciting similar states? Well, I think he and Christina both devised, his wife mm -hmm. devised uh, holotropic breath work. And he had noticed <clears throat> in doing psychedelic sessions, like LSD sessions, that sometimes the session would complete itself and be just fine. And then sometimes something else would start up again at the very end and would not complete itself. And that what the inner healer would do is start doing rapid breathing like pranayama, mm. bastrico, or uh, an, uh, I can't remember the other one, yeah. fire breath. Yeah. yeah, one of those pranayamas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, Chris mentioned, he, Chris Beish mentioned that he would do that, you know, snot blowing out his nose and he's doing this right. fast breathing and it would just happen, be happening did, spontaneously, you know. I, my big question is, where does all the snot come from? <laughs> right. Just like, what? It comes. So, yeah, so that's what he decided to do. And they just had people do rapid breathing, not, not rapid breathing, but continuous breathing without a pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. Deep. But I think what they really contributed was all the safety features, all the permission, protection, and connection features of the container. And, you know, if people that were doing are going to do or want to do psychedelic work, there are now trainings to be accepted by them, but the, the experiential component of that is necessarily brief. But the Groff transpersonal training has that all built in. So, you know, I really recommend it. It's the best, best thing I know of that. In fact, the people that are teaching the MAPS training now are graduates of the holotropic mm. breathwork training. Well, you've done both, presumably. Um, how do you feel that the subjective experience compares? I haven't done the training to be a psychedelic therapist. Oh, but you've done psychedelics, and you've also done a lot I've of, done and you've done a lot of holotropic breath work. So, you know, yeah. how would you compare them subjectively? Oh, I get it. Um, I think all the same kinds of of 
experiences can happen either way. Mm -hmm. I think each medicine and the breath work has their own characteristic. When you do the breath work, it's natural. Mm -hmm. And you can give it more energy by breathing more at any time and, and stop breathing and take a break or rest or contemplate. And with the psychedelic, you don't really have that chance. You're on the um, uh, roll, on the roller coaster. So, and every medicine has its characteristic. So they're all different in a way. What do you think of the mechanics of um, holotropic breathwork? I mean, some would argue, oh, you're just flushing the brain with oxygen or some such thing, you're hyperventilating. Um, but obviously a lot of profound stuff goes on that couldn't really be explained by that, expl by that you know, explanation. So what do you think it's actually doing on a subtle level to evoke the kinds of experiences it does? I don't know the chemistry of it. Mm -hmm. I should, but I've never been interested in research or chemistry or <laughs> <laughs> that stuff. I'm interested in quantum physics, but not, mm. not particularly chemistry. So I don't know, but I know that it takes you into a non-ordinary state and turns off your resistances to that. Mm. Somehow gives you the experience that's next on the list of the inner healer's wish list. Mm. I suspect, and this is just a th theory, that um, you know it's doing something to the subtle energy system, the, the nadis, the, the shushumna, you know, the kundalini, all that stuff. Um, I'm throwing a bunch of terms out here, but that it's it's somehow enlivening or awakening the subtle energy system. Because, I mean, the yogis put great importance on breath and um, have all kinds of techniques involving breath. Um, and for that very reason, that they consider the breath, for instance, the, the, the two nostrils, when you go back and forth, right. uh, doing a certain kind of pranayama, it's uh, thought that one nostril corresponds to the, e the ida and the other to the pingala, which are these two right. channels that run parallel with the shashumna up the center of the spine, and that you balance, and the, there's even an explanation that if, if you notice, every couple hours or something, <clears throat> the, your, your breath will shift predominantly throughout the day from one nostril to the other, right. and, th and that's because there are these two subtle nervous systems that trade off in functioning and um, give each other a break. And that you can balance those two nervous systems doing pranayama by going back and forth more quickly than, than they would ordinarily go back and forth. And that, that right. creating that balance then sets the stage for a more profound experience in meditation. In any case, um, I have a feeling that somehow, knowingly or otherwise, holotropic breath work uses that, those mechanics to trigger yes. the experiences it does. I would think so. I, it it um, kind of kickstarts prana yeah and <clears throat> and then the prana probably takes you to whatever experience i don't know it's <laughs> it's a mystery how it how it happens but yeah. i know there's a, a, often a lot of physical chronic kind of experiences that people have do they sometimes have kundalini awakenings or you know some of the phenomena that are associated with those you know crying and shaking around and, you know, kriyas, they call it, that kind of stuff? I think when you have a prana opening, there's always a chance that might also be a kundalini opening. Mm -hmm. For me, the first time I did holotropic breath work, I think I had a prana opening. I saw, I saw Shiva hmm. and um, kind of reaching out to Shiva. And then after that, I had a, the week after that, I was at a month long at Esalen with Stan and Christina. And, and that week I had what I now think was a healing illness where I couldn't eat. I really, I just couldn't eat. I had a high fever and I mm -hmm. stayed in bed and missed a week of the workshop. Mm -hmm. And then some people were doing MDMA and going down to the beach and doing MDMA. And I thought, well, I'll try a little bit of it, you know. So I went and did 25 milligrams, which, you know, uh, 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 it's 125 is the normal dose. Uh -huh. And I really had, a, had an opening. And then the next week I went down and did it and did a normal dose. 
And that was the beginning of my Kundalini opening. Huh. And uh, it was powerful. It was like, you know, the first thing I knew when I had taken that was I heard a baby crying, mm-hmm. being born and crying. And then I realized it was me. Wow. I was so deep inside, you know, and then it just kept going for I don't know, 15 hours or something like that. All kinds of kriyas and all kinds of stuff. And then it lasted for five years without the drugs. So I think what happened was, I tell the story because I think what happened was that MDMA removed the fear so that uh, the fear of uh, holding back, letting go, you know, letting, letting that energy move through my body and get rid of all the blocks that were there. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good to keep an open mind. I mean, you know, I went through my drug thing in the 60s. And after that, I, I just thought never again, I wouldn't touch the stuff I'm doing fine without them. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, in regular meditation practice, but, you know, it's like everything I'm exposed to these days in terms of talking to all these people, I, it's made me much more open minded about the, you know, potential for these things, as long as it's done very responsibly and seriously and absolutely because you know, yeah. otherwise it's just going to cause more harm than good yeah mm. i agree <laughs> um in the notes you sent me you said something about paradigm shifts what did you want to say about paradigm shift it's just the word i use personal paradigm shift sometimes instead of spiritual emergence mm-hmm. or spiritual emergency because Sometimes people have what I would say is a spiritual emerging and they say, oh, it's not spiritual. <laughs> it's not spiritual. Mm. But it's a big shift in their belief system. Mm. What happens is their belief system it becomes too small, does not hold what they're their experience. It. Yeah, they're outgrowing it. Yeah. And I think sometimes that can be slow as in an emergence, spiritual emergence. So it just happens here and there when the inner healer has the right conditions and so forth. Or it can, you can just veer over into the fast lane (laughs) with it and it becomes a spiritual emergency, which simply means that you're not functional in the usual way that you have been functional for a period of time. Yeah. And you might look psychotic, but you're not. Hmm. Although you can be, I mean, I've also although you can be, yeah. Yes. I mean, I've seen people do long meditations and then actually really get psychotic, and you know. Yeah, sometimes uh, getting into an ordinary state triggers triggers bipolar episodes. Right. So you have to be careful about that. Yeah, and a therapist or or over you know someone who's shepherding people through these processes needs to be careful about who he accepts. Yes. People need to be screened somehow. Yes. Well, in holotropic breathwork, there's a medical form and those questions are asked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another note you sent about, is about external versus internal locus of control. And I think I know, I think we may have already alluded to that in terms of mm-hmm. like, you know, laying down codes of ethics versus from within knowing what to do you know, spontaneously because you're of inner guidance. Is that what that phrase refers to? Yes, it is. Yeah. You know, the laws, the codes, the standards of care, all the external things that are really there because somebody had challenges in the past and and harmed somebody and somebody wrote it up as a, as a law, don't right? do don't, don't do, do this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so they're very valuable, but then there's the internal way that we find re- right relationship in our particular situations and it, we have to be careful with the internal way of navigating because we can use rationalizations and fool ourselves yeah very very true um boy uh, th- that comes up all too often where where people just feel like they can trust their inner guidance system and it's really actually malfunctioning and and they can get real crazy. I mean, you know, the term Maya uh, or illusion uh, and, you know, it's said we're all sort of under its influence to some extent. And one of its features, (laughs) I think, is that 
it doesn't let you know that you're under its influence when you are. So you can feel like you're completely justified in doing this or that, and yet you're you know, two others. If they could see you clearly, you're you're way off the beam. That's right, and that's a a, a good reason to do peer supervision. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to that quadrant of the Johari window where you don't see yourself. Right. Others do. You know that saying that uh, that government is best which governs least. And uh, I think Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching that, you know, the more enlightened a society is, the less actual laws and rules it's going to need. People will just spontaneously act right if, if the kind of ambient level of consciousness in a society is high. <clears throat> um, but th that's an important point there because if it isn't high, you can't just dismantle the government, as some people seem to think would be a good idea. Um, you know, get rid of the EPA or whatever. People aren't they're just going to behave properly if we do that. There needs to be laws as long as people aren't inclined to spontaneously <clears throat> act in a, in a healthy way. Yes, and I, I think we're, I, I hope we're moving in the larger sense in the right direction um, with, you know, things like the Me Too movement as the beginning. I think we're just at the very beginning of an ethos change where people are sick of all the lying and it, enough people, it has to be enough people are sick of the lying and other things that are wrong, greed. Yeah. yeah. And we've elected a president that gives us such blatant examples of such things that we can exactly. all just, <laughs> there's no question about it. It's there it is. <laughs> um, okay. Now, one more question here from Narsi. Let's see if we've covered this. I think we have. Uh, can students who are vulnerable um, be identified through po profiling by the spiritual organization to prevent any problems? As a therapist, can you comment? I mean, you mentioned that, know. that Stan Groff's thing, you know, they tried to, there yeah, was an application uh, process. And, well, that's, that's a medical form. Yeah. Where we ask if, uh, somebody has been hospitalized if they ever had a bipolar uh, episode and if they're in therapy currently and if their therapist thinks this is a good idea mm -hmm. if so so but I, I think it's the job of a responsible party in this case the spiritual leader to take care of the vulnerable people vulnerable people that come yeah to him or her and in the proper way for that person. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's, well, this isn't, this isn't, this doesn't feel like I can give you what you need right now. Maybe I need to refer you to somebody. Right. And take responsibility for it, not say you're wrong for being vulnerable. This is, I can't give you what you need and know what I, I have to know what I can give you and what I can't. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing you say in your book is that um, every ethical misstep was taken because of a healing impulse. So let's make that concrete. Let's say a, a teacher is misbehaving, sleeping with his students or something like that, or taking their money or whatever. Um, those are ethical missteps. How are those things um, expressions of a healing impulse? Well, the healing impulse can be either for the student or client. Mm -hmm. or it can be for oneself. Okay. And the, the benefit of looking for the healing impulse is to find out why you did something so you can have compassion for yourself for doing it. And then understanding and compassion and then do self-reflection about how you can avoid doing it in the future. Okay, so if, so if you get to the point where you're admitting that you did something wrong, exactly. which, which doesn't necessarily happen right away, then you can think, oh my God, how could I have screwed up like that? What is it about me that I need to look at more carefully that caused me to do that kind of thing and so that I don't do that kind of thing again? Right. And I think this brings up that there are really two categories of people who are misbehaving, as, mm -hmm. you, as you say. And one is the predator category of people who intentionally do that. They might be sociopaths or they might be power hungry or greedy or whatever. Um, they might be addicted 
sex and love addicts and not be in recovery. So that that's that. And they're probably not interested in this model of self-reflection at all. And those people would have to be dealt with by the justice system mm -hmm. and by disciples or students who pursued that to make sure that they were taken out of the way of doing harm. And the other category is people who are unaware, who uh, maybe could have not done something if they had had some information about transference and counter-transference or um, their own vulnerabilities. And they're interested in knowing about themselves. Otherwise, this won't work. The self-reflection yeah. won't work. Except, I think, if we change the ethos of the culture to expect professionals. I said this once before, but it bears repeating. Expect re professionals to do self-reflection and to be ethical. Mm -hmm. And if we get to that point, then more people will be willing to do self-reflection because it will influence their, their pocketbook. Yeah. And be, not only the pocketbook, but because they're sincerely interested in becoming better people. And, yes. You know, growing spiritually and so on, and they don't want to be doing things that are going to thwart that. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, when you make a statement like that, it, it can see, be, seem a little discouraging because you think, oh, God, how can we change the culture? Culture is huge, and it, it takes so long for culture to change. It's like turning an ocean liner, you know, which has a strong momentum, and it, it's going to take a long time to turn it. But on the other hand, we've seen some rather ra radical <laughs> and almost abrupt cultural shifts, you know, in the last decade or so. Yeah, that's um, right. And so that gives one optimism. Yeah, and we have the Internet. And yeah, that's helping. That that makes information travel. I think the Me Too movement is a really good example. I think we're at the very beginning of this mm -hmm. ethos change, and the Me Too movement is right now focused on consequences and punishment for people. And it's interesting because for the people that we've seen, most of the people that have been outed in some way and been in responsible positions um, would not have done self-reflection, I don't think. Yeah. You know, so this is, that's, that's absolutely appropriate. Mm -hmm. It's absolute, you know, I felt myself like, I, I was saying me too privately about some small incidents in my life. And I was like, me too, me too. And I was really rooting for um, the people that had really come out and, and done that. Yeah, so I think that's how it begins to happen. And then we have to look at how can the people that want to change not be not be punished, but really be encouraged to talk about, and maybe it's in therapy, maybe it's in peer supervision, maybe it's publicly, talk about how they made those mistakes and model that for other people talk about how it happened for them so that other people kind of get it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting in the in the public eye, there are certain people that just sort of, you know, plead innocent and keep fighting till they go to jail, you know, like Bill Cosby or Jerry Sandusky and people like that. And, mm -hmm. and others who, who seem very contrite, I mean, God, you know, I've really screwed up and I'm going to, I'm going to learn as much as I can from this and not yeah. be, be this way anymore, like Michael Cohen and, and some others. Um, although there's a, yeah, there's a ahead. guy in, there's a guy in the um, psychedelic community who did some egregious things uh -huh. and has recently written an article about them and mea culpa. And a lot of people are really angry with him and said, you know, he can't get away with this. Um, there's an article, it's in Shakruna, an online journal about psychedelics and plant medicines. And some people are really angry with him for, uh, he, they think he's getting away with something by apologizing. But I thought the article was really thought provoking because he talked about all the reasons why he did what he did and apologized. And 
I think, more of that. We have to have a path for people to change. Yeah, uh, you say that in your book, and I really like that point. You know, I mean, if we're just going to forever, um, you know, condemn those who have made mistakes, even if they are uh, trying to help, trying to change and showing contrition and apology and so on, then it's not going to inspire a whole lot of people to try to change themselves. You know, there has That's to be right. forgiveness and compassion. I think there has for a long time been a taboo among professionals like therapists and doctors mm -hmm. to say when they've done wrong, although doctors have some surgeons have some process by which they have uh, they talk about what didn't work or mistakes they've made in surgery, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I read that in that book on mortality. Mm -hmm. I can't remember his name, but... but I think uh, Andrew Cohen is a good example. I mean, a lot of people are still pissed at him. Um, but, you know, after his so-called downfall, um, you know, he really, he's done a lot to try to I mean, he went around and traveled around and met face to face with everyone who would be willing to meet with him, whom he had wronged, and in order to apologize in person. And he's done various kinds of therapy and, you know, some mm -hmm. some ayahuasca or something, and you know, working on himself in various ways. He even, you know, I've heard he, you know, drives an Uber sometimes to make ends meet. He's not yeah. not too proud to do that. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I had taken his interview down for a year or two, and then I, when I heard that, I put it back up again. So I thought, well, he's, he's really trying, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to support each other in our walk through this life. We're all going to make mistakes of various kinds, and some are more egregious than others. Yeah. But, you know, if somebody's willing to change, there has to be redemption. The guy who wrote the Ramayana, who was named Valmiki, um, was a, a highway robber and a murderer. And yeah. that was how he made his living. And he, he was about to rob some sages that came along, some, some saints. And they, they said, well, before you do it, go home and check with your wife and see if she's willing to share in this karma. And so he went home and spoke to his wife. And she said, no way. Said, I appreciate the support, but this is your karma. So he, he, he like hit him like a ton of bricks. And he went back to the sages and said, help me, save me. And so they, <laughs> they gave him a mantra. And he sat and went into meditation. And as the saying goes, he sat there for seven years. And an ant hill built up around him. It, Valmiki, Valmiki means ant-born sage. But in any case, it says in the Gita that even if you're the greatest of all sinners, you can cross over the ocean of evil or something by by the raft of knowledge alone so it holds out and there are many examples i mean saul you know who became the the, the apostle i was Paul. thinking of yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there's examples in these traditions of people who are real scoundrels you know becoming mm -hmm. really transformed yeah okay now um do you want to comment any more on that before we move on no okay good so um you sent me a graphic and uh, I'm going to show it on the screen now. I'm showing it on the screen. Explain this graphic to us. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, the book that I wrote, The Ethics of Caring, is based on this structured diagram. And, and it came to me through two of the great religions, Hinduism and, and Buddhism. And it's a graphic of the chakras. Mm -hmm. And instead of the usual uh, meaning of the chakras, I have named these life areas that ethical missteps are often taken in. So uh, you have the, the chart you're working yes, on. Yes, the, the, the audience can see the chart right now. Oh, good. So <clears throat> if you look at it, the, there's money and security is the first life area, and then sex, power, and those are the personal chakras. These are the personal issues, and that's basically what ethics is usually all about, money, sex, and power. And then what is very little written about is the transpersonal chakras, which I've named truth. I love truth, insight, and oneness. And I'm looking over here because my chart is over here. I'm going to put it over here so I'm in the front. Sure. So it's in front of me, so I'm looking at it. Um, 
because a lot of those issues come up when we're working with people on ordinary states of consciousness. And on either side, on one side are the personal desires and longings that pull us off the track of right relationship. Now, the track of right relationship is the shashumna, the line up through the center of the chakras. And I'm just calling that right relationship. But if you imagine that that line is a rubber band and that the fears or desires, the fears on one side or the desires on the other side are pulling off the track of right relationship, kind of derailing right relationship with that desire or with that fear, then you can use this chart whenever you have a gut feeling that something isn't right, that something is wrong in the relationship with a client or a student and kind of look and see which life area might this be working in and what is my longing or desire that's happening and what is my fear or spiritual fear that's happening on the other side. So that's basically it. And then the book is organized around these centers so that there is a chapter for each of these centers and then self-reflective questions at the end of it. And in the chapter, I talk about transference and counter-transference issues that are associated with that particular life area in the center. So it can be used for self-reflection if you're a professional or a responsible party, or it can be used by a peer supervision group to help them identify what's going on and talk about it or it can be used in formal supervision or as a complement to traditional education, ethics education. Good. So that's the, that, you know, there are other, um, that's that chart, but there are other um, elements to the model, you know, like I mentioned the, the protection, permission, and connection. And I mentioned the question, who's this for? And that, that question, who's this for, by the way, can be used by anybody in everyday ethical uh, situations. You know, if you're talking to a friend, for example, and they're really excited about something and they're trying to tell you everything, and it makes you think, oh, I have a story about that or I have an experience about that. Well, when you ask who's this for, you can decide whether is this the time to tell my story or is it the time to really listen to my friend? So it can help in that way. That's an interesting point. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I don't know if, if what you just said tells us anything uh, about, I mean, it, we'll, we'll see if we can make it relevant to this interview, but my wife and I often remark about how there's so many people who you have a conversation with them and they're going on and on and on about themselves and you're listening patiently and you're at, maybe you're asking questions and and uh, you know it's almost like that joke you know me 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 okay enough about me what do you think about me um, <laughs> 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 uh, and then the moment you start to sort of reciprocate and say hey, oh yeah well let me tell you what's going on in my life well I got to go now you know they, they space out and they just kind of um, not that totally lose interest. So I, I think that might kind of relate to the whole ethics topic in a way, um, just because, you know, ethics is really about concern for others, ultimately. Um, yes. And perhaps we can develop ethics by culturing a, a genuine interest in and concern for others. Yes. And I think so in just everyday life, but there are also times in everyday life where we become the responsible party, like, and we really have to think about ethics and who's this for. Like if somebody goes in the hospital or you visit a friend in the hospital, uh -huh. the focus is really on them, just like as if you were a professional, you know, you want to, to be there for them. And another example is early sobriety. All, you know, people are all over the place in early sobriety and you have to kind of listen to them and make sure you take, get your needs taken care of in other ways. Yeah. You're there for them, not the other way around. Exactly. Because they're the, they're the needy ones. 
Yeah, and it happens that way in a marriage, for example, when, you know, <laughs> I always say, you know, we can't both be crazy at the same time. <laughs> you know, somebody Tag has team. to be this. Somebody has to be the sitter. Yeah. Um, so I think we, if you can go back and forth with that and really be clear about what your role is at any given time and be really flexible to go back and forth fast if you need to, mm. it works much better. Yeah. I imagine being a professional um, therapist helps with that because you, you definitely have to keep switching hats. You know, you're there for the others and then you go home and, and perhaps right. you know, then you can be the one who someone else is you know, therefore. It's even, it's even harder because I do therapy at home. So I have to, Oh brother, <laughs> <laughs> I have to change hats going downstairs. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, well, um, let's, uh, let's have an overview. Maybe, maybe we'll end soon or maybe we'll go on a little longer depending on what comes up. And if anybody mm -hmm. wants to send in a question, this would be the time to do it. Um, but in, in light of everything we've talked about for the last almost hour and three quarters, um, you know, do you have any sort of uh, gaps you'd like to fill in, anything we haven't brought up, any sort of oversight or, or summary kind of per, per, big perspective points that you want to emphasize and leave people with or anything along those lines? Well, I think what we're talking about, we've touched on that fact that it's a really big change that's happening. Uh -huh. And your guidelines and my book are small pieces of that. Right change. Um, but something really big is happening. And I think what we might need is something like ethical awareness training, although I, I hate the acronym for that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, like we had diversity training, when people really had to um, discover where their prejudices were and how what how people were different from them and not different from them and, uh, and uh, companies did it well, they still do it yeah and they still do it i mean it's an ongoing thing but there was a big there was a a peak of a lot of that happened at one point right and maybe that has to happen with ethical awareness and self reflection but i think it's going to take a lot of people getting interested in this and and talking about it and deciding what to do. Yeah, it's interesting. What's what's their piece of it? Right. Well, um, I know that with the ASI, which is really a rather small thing still, um, you know, we, we've had several different webinars with people speaking um, and uh, you know, pondering these points, but usually we only have, you know, a dozen or two people online, so it's just a drop in the bucket. Um, but, you know, Maybe um, maybe it's a start, and uh, you know it's. Um, I, 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 we do feel that part of our whole purpose there, is, with that thing, is to just kind of in, do our whatever we can to enliven a, an appreciation of this in the collective consciousness, and specifically in the collective spiritual community. It just needs to be more explicit and and you know, more out in the open and more you know, being pondered by people more. Yes, and that's your piece of it and your colleagues yeah. piece of it. And and that's great. And that's what you do. But I think getting more people interested in it, hopefully, this interview getting out there will get people interested in the dimensions of ethics and not, you know, kind of what everybody's idea has been about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and most of the people who are listening to this interview are interested in enlightenment. They're interested in, in awakening and stuff, uh, you know, and the, the fulfillment that that state promises. And, um, you know, I just want to say that um, the whole ethical consideration is part of that. It's a, it's a feature, an aspect of the kind of development that the word enlightenment or awakening uh, signifies. And mm -hmm. so it's sort of incumbent upon a person who's interested in spiritual development to be interested in ethics as part of that development. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I have one other thing I could talk about. It's kind of like a, a pet thought that nobody has ever really been interested in. Oh, let's see. <laughs> so let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it was, you know, in that last chapter of my book, Considering Holotropic Breathwork, mm -hmm. that I don't know much about Jung, but I do know that there are four functions that he talks about, the, the thinking and feeling that are paired and sensation and intuition that are paired. And I came across this, um, I think it was just one or two sentences in a book by Castillejo called um, Knowing Woman, where she talked about the fourth function being an opening to the magical realm or the unconscious. And I put that together with spiritual emergence or spiritual emergency. And I thought, I wonder if spiritual emergence and spiritual emergency come through the fourth function. And I looked at my own experience and I, you know, this, these functions, by the way, are tested when you take the Myers-Briggs test. So I looked at my own experience and my spiritual emergency emergence came through Kundalini, which sensation was my fourth function. So And the fourth function again is opening to the magical realm, opening to the yes, to the sort see, of the, the unseen, the transcendent, yeah, whatever we yeah. want to call it. Yeah. The idea is that the first function that we have, the primary function, is the one where we have mastery and the one where we use most of the time to run our lives. Mm -hmm. And the fourth function we kind of don't pay any attention to. It's yeah. undefended. It feels like it's not us. We're not identified with it. Uh, most people. <clears throat> most people. Right. That, thank you. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so what I noticed was, it, it, this is my... This is how I do research. I just, it's anecdotal and observant and it's not, but I think it would be a really great research project since there is the Myers-Briggs and there is, there are people that are having spiritual emergency. But what I noticed was that I worshiped the Kundalini energy coming through me, you know, in terms of sexual energy and other kinds of energy. And those who have thinking as a first function and feeling as a fourth function might have an experience where the, the feeling realm opens up for them and they go, oh my goodness, I'm having a feeling. I'm, I'm sad right now. You know, it's almost divine feeling. And people who have thinking as a fourth function might be enamored of new ideas, might go back to graduate school, like maps, those kinds of things, um, because their first function is sensation. They're very concrete, normally. And what am I missing? Um, intuition, the third, intuition, yeah. intuition mm -hmm. as a fourth function might be kind of a psychic opening for a spiritual emergency where you're flooded with psychic voices or intuitions or psychic knowings and may have trouble turning that off or whatever. So the idea, and one of the things that I think happens is that the, in a spiritual emergence, the first function gets turned off temporarily, at least it happened to me. And I read about it in uh, one of Jung's, I can't remember who, Mary, we Mary Louise France or something like don't know her name anyway she wrote that it has to be turned off it's kind of a death rebirth the one that you use all the time has to be turned off so that this can all come in and become part of you and until it really integrates you experience it as a divine happening mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting, and maybe somebody listening will think it's interesting and do research on it, and that would be good. Yeah, I think it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, higher consciousness or enlightenment or whatever, you know, some define it as, um, w well, they, they contrast it, for instance, with the ordinary states of consciousness that we experience, like waking, dreaming, and sleeping. And you have to turn off waking to experience sleeping. In a way. Yeah, yeah. You can't experience them at the same time. Um, although the, 
the fourth state of consciousness, as it's defined in, in the Vedic system, Turiya, it actually means fourth, um, is it's understood that um, through repeated experience of it, it becomes a continuum that is there throughout waking, dreaming, and sleeping. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what you said just then, um, you know, to, brought to my mind the thought that spiritual development is not about having temporary experiences, although you do have them, but for that depth of, of awareness that you may dip into momentarily to become a, a 24 seven feature of your, of your experience. And, um, so there's an integration that takes place. So mm -hmm. you, look, yes. you know, like you say, you, you couldn't be in some extraordinary state and drive home like afterwards. You know, you need to sort of get back to the normal consciousness to drive home. But an enlightened person can drive a car, and yet they yeah. are in an extraordinary state by comparison with all the other people in traffic around them. It's just that they've learned how to integrate, or they've been able to integrate so as to maintain that higher consciousness in the midst of so-called mundane experience. Yes, on the interview last week, they talked about um, who was the guru. I can never remember his name, even though I have his picture up. Um, but anyway, he took a, a oh, Neem Karoli Baba. Neem Karoli yeah, Baba. Neem Karoli Baba. He took 1,200 micrograms of LSD. Nothing happened, apparently. <laughs> Nothing happened that was outside Certainly. himself. Anyway, yeah. So, yeah, well, what happened for me was that all this stuff was happening in Kriyas and automatic postures and, and uh, mudras and everything. And I stopped being able to plan and think. And I guess thinking is my second function, but I, I stopped being able to do that. And I was an executive director of an agency. Mm. And I just had to trust. I had to learn to trust that I would know what to say and what to do and whatever was coming up in my schedule would be handled yeah and in time <laughs> how'd that work out and it worked out it always worked out yeah that's an interesting point um i think the average person sort of feels that they are in control or tries to be you know yeah and there's a vedic saying which is brahman is the charioteer it's actually that larger intelligence that is or should be you know, running your life. And if you're going to let Brahman be the charioteer, you kind of have to relinquish the reins of the chariot, right. you know? I had to do that for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I really, yeah. How so? What do you mean? Well, I just, I had to, um, get, you know, the phrase is give it to the guru, or, uh -huh. you know, I just had to say, uh, I'm not in control here, I just have to show up and be who I am. Yeah, that actually, just to drag this out a little bit further, that actually brings us back to an ethics point. Um, oh, okay. Because some people say, I am not the doer. And whatever I do, it's just the gunas doing it, or, or it's, you know, it's, I don't know, the devil made me do it or <laughs> whatever. Um, I've heard that as used as an alibi by spiritual teachers for doing outrageous things um, so and there's some who argue we don't have a self and we don't have free will and it's all just conditioning or DNA or whatever so maybe you could comment on on the notion that you know whether you agree with that or if you disagree how so well I think you can fool yourself and that's why we need each other mm -hmm. you know to give us give ourselves feedback but I think if you, like in, this, in the case of this interview, if I had done the preparation and I was nervous and this and I've never done this before and blah, blah, blah. But then I just said, I, I just have to be myself and let the Shakti take care of it. And I, and I think that's okay, is to let go. And as long as you, you know, I don't think it was didn't turn out very badly. So. Oh, it's great. And you've been preparing uh, for it for decades, you know? I mean, you know this stuff. This is, this well, is, that's what people told me. Yeah. This is, <laughs> you, you've been living and breathing this stuff for, for a long time, written yeah. a whole book about it. So, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what you're talking about. Um, but there is that issue that some people justify their behavior by saying that 
there, I am not the doer, or even that the world is Maya and it doesn't matter what you do, you know, because it's all an illusion. I mean, I hear this, yeah. and I think that's a real cop out. I do too. Yeah. 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 All right. Well. Uh, I, you did fine, by the way. I think this is a great interview, <laughs> and, and I really enjoyed talking Thank to you. you. And uh, you know, you, you really—in fact, I mentioned you to um, Jack O'Keefe, who was who is one of the founders of the ASI, and she immediately ordered her, your book. She said, "Oh, I got to read oh, this. This is great." That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been great. I, you're a great interviewer. Good to talk to you. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so good to talk to you, and. Um, I want to thank those who've been listening or watching. Um, if, as I said in the beginning, if this is new to you and you want to check out previous ones, there's a past interviews menu on batgap.com where you can find all the previous ones <clears throat> categorized in various ways. Um, if you like to listen to things while you're driving or cutting the grass or whatever, this exists as an audio podcast to which you can subscribe. Um, you can be notified by email of new interviews whenever they're posted, if you wish. There's a, a place to sign up for that. And, uh, you know, we appreciate your financial support if you feel like contributing to the support of this. There's a PayPal button on every page of the site. And the, some other things, if you look under the past, under the various menus on the site, you'll find some little odds and ends. There's even a ringtone for your phone, if you want, with the Bat Gap theme song <laughs> <laughs> that my friend David Buckland put together. Uh -huh. yeah. So anyway, thanks to the audience, and thank you again, Kelly. I really enjoyed my time with you. Uh, me too. Yep. Thanks. And I'll probably see you out in, at Sand in October. I, I think so. Good. All yeah. right. See you then. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.